In giving you this brief glance at the arts of Korea, the textbook starts with the Three Kingdoms period. So if we think about Korean history as a timeline, sort of like China's, you know, we have these very ancient cultures that have been archaeologically excavated that are Neolithic cultures moving into Bronze Age cultures. And what's interesting about Korea is we see China's influence on Korea very early when in the Han Dynasty when colonies are established by China on the Korean um, Peninsula. Where we're stepping in is the Three Kingdoms period when the peninsula is broken up obviously into three kingdoms and let's look at that so this map helps you to see that how we have the Koguryo kingdom in the north and central peninsula down here Sheila and then Bakche which can also be spelled Pakche because of course these transliterations are never 100% accurate right different language systems different phonetic patterns the artwork that you'll learn about, the first artwork you'll learn about in conjunction with the Three Kingdoms period is derived from the Sheila Kingdom and the date 5th to 6th century CE. I want to point that out because what's happening in China, <laughs> right? Well, in the 200s, the Han Dynasty is falling and then we have our period of disunity, right, for 300 or so years. What's interesting is that at this moment, we know from the pottery that the pottery from Korea is also being taken to, is being transmitted to Japan, and that Japan is being influenced by the tomb culture of Korea. So Japan, we will be looking at a tomb cult culture, and we see that same kind of tomb culture for the elites, the royals, as we saw in the Shang and Zhou dynasties. So these splendid, absolutely jaw-dropping crowns have been found made of gold and jade. And we can appreciate them on the level of gold working technique, right? The, um, the Korean kingdom was called by Islamic traders at the time, the kingdom of gold, because they were the best gold workers. We can see jade and gold being used as magical materials to prevent decay, similarly to how we saw it in China. Um, and gold being a power and status material in so many cultures, right? Gold crowns are familiar to us from other cultures in that it, it evokes the beauty of the sun and the power of the sun as kind of the ultimate source. So the societies here of the Three Kingdoms were, were aristocratic societies rigid social stratification where you basically had the free versus the unfree so you have freeborn aristocracy and common citizens and then you have a hereditary class of slaves birth determined your rank and privilege and the crowns are linked to the idea of shamanism for so the rulers seem to have been understood to have shamanic powers so it's very interesting to explore these beautiful crowns in relationship to shamanism what is it well we know they're linked to shamanism for a number of reasons but one is the significant form so we have tree forms antler forms these are these are recurring in shamanism across the world shamanism is the world's oldest religion and the the visual elements and the thought process of shamanism seem to be relatively consistent whether you're talking about Korea, Siberia, whether you're talking about Russia, or Ireland. Because what you see are shamans beating drums with antlers, which are understood to be a tree of life, axis mundi. Let's watch a video to see what I mean. So the speaker in the video I'm going to show you is wonderful, learned, a, a great thinker. He's also about a thousand years old, and he doesn't seem to know that using male specific terms, which he does, he and mankind, to stand for all people is an outdated and discredited convention. Why? Not just because it's sexist and rude, but because it distorts and misleads analysis. He, when, if we are being told over and over again that the shaman is he and him, we don't realize that actually there were female shamans. Shaw women? Let's not worry about that. 
So we're going to look at a tiny little section from this helpful video, Different Paths, Shamanism, Cults, and Religion on Demand. This is available on DBC Library Films on Demand, so you can come back to it. The word shaman came from Southern Asia by way of Russian. It meant a magic priest who practiced trances, divination, and healing in Northern Siberian and Altaic societies. He was not a sorcerer, cast no spells, and did not seek to do harm. The important role which he performed was that of a purifier. The shaman, alone of his tribe, undertook an ascension into heaven in a state of trance to obtain the power to cure an illness or to see into the future. This cosmic journey reflected a universe made up of two parallel zones, the earth and the sky, joined by a world axis, which could be a mountain, a tree, or the central pole of a tent. This axis allowed the shaman to circulate between the two zones. In shamanistic cosmology, the earth is one divinity among many. But the supreme god is heaven, from which everything which exists on earth receives its soul and its strength. Other free-floating spirits, which are both benevolent or malevolent forces, wander between the two essential cosmic zones. These can assume different guises, and often appeared in animal form. Useful or harmful, therefore, became fundamental reference points for shamanism. Shamanism believes that illness is brought about by the fact that the soul has left the body. If it does not return, the patient will die. The soul can also be chased out of the body by a spirit, which then takes its place. Whatever the case may be, it is the role of the shaman to ascend into heaven in the company of benevolent spirits and to fight malevolent spirits to regain the soul which is lost and bring it back to the body, driving out the intruder if necessary. A knowledge of the future belonged to the god in heaven and to spirits, which appeared in animal form in interstellar space, or who haunted the earth. Thanks to his ecstatic journey, the shaman could make them reveal their secrets. But in order to leave Earth and journey through the cosmos, he had to assume the appearance of an animal. And he wore fur or tanned hide, horns and claws, or feathers or wings. He also took up shaman tools, a bronze mirror which reflected the universe, and especially a drum, the skin of which was decorated with symbolic images, and especially a drum, the skin of which was decorated with symbolic images. He would beat the drum as he danced until he fell to the ground, either still shaking or completely inert. Before this, he would have pronounced the necessary formula. This phenomenon of the shaman appeared in Africa, in Oceania, in North America, and in Southeast Asia. But it is principally known in Turkish and Mongolian areas of Asia, where it was first observed in the Middle Ages, and where it can still be found today. In shamanism, a distinction is made between the ascension of man towards the gods and possession, or the descent of the gods in man, which is one of the characteristics of animism. 